Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think you all realize, or you should realize, we live in very, very serious times. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. We're living in the times that Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. The things that would be taking place before his very return. The love of most is growing cold around us. And we have to ensure it doesn't happen in the church. God's word says that you'll know his disciples by the love that they have for one another. We must have love. We must show that love. Because love is action. The church has been scattered. Knowledge has increased, as the book of Daniel said it would before the return of Christ. People are going to and fro throughout the earth, and you could go buy a ticket tomorrow and be on the other side of the earth in a matter of hours, 12 hours, whatever that flight is. I think it's 12, 15, maybe to China. <clears throat> Haven't checked because I don't care to go there. It's too long a flight for me. Nothing against the place, but if it goes beyond three hours, I'm out. <clears throat> Evil is rising like it never has. I know Solomon said nothing's changed under the sun, but brethren, things are changing. When people can go out and take 50-some lives like they're absolutely nothing, I don't recall any scriptures where in Noah's time, People were going out killing people by the mass. Now, I know there's always been wars. That's a different subject. But to just go and murder multiple, countless people without a passing thought. Some have admitted they were just bored and decided to go snuff somebody out. It's absolute evil, and you know exactly where it comes from, Satan and his evil demons. Times that the scriptures describe as a perverse generation. Perilous times indeed. And they should be very sobering to God's called out ones. In fact, it says in another place to mark those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are taking a place around them. Do we sigh and cry? as we watch these horrific events happening in our nation, happening in this world. Families destroyed. I see some of these things and my heart just goes out to them. And you ask God in prayer, I know what it's like to lose a grandchild. Many of us here have lost a close loved one. Imagine someone, a loved one of yours, just going to the store and somebody takes their life like it meant absolutely nothing. So we look at the times we're in. What about the church of God? What condition is the church of God in? We see what's happening in the world. And many times it begins in the world and, and things creep into the church as well. And I'm not talking about the abominations that are taking place. I'm talking about, well, let's go through a few things here. It wasn't that many years ago there was a great falling away. It happened in the worldwide Church of God, which had hundreds of thousands of members, called out ones that were at Sabbath services every week, that kept the holy days, that lived according to God's commandments as best they could. They lived to be overcomers. They prayed daily. They longed and looked forward to the coming kingdom of our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And hundreds of thousands of those members fell away. They're no longer a part of the church today. You can go visit them somewhere else in a Sunday-keeping congregation. And I'm not putting anyone down. Those people knew what the truth was. God called them out, and they knew the truth. And they fell away from it. Why? <clears throat> I know many like to blame an organization. I've heard many horror stories. 
And there were some things that should have never happened in that church and God allowed it to fall apart because of it. Did that mean the members needed to fall away? If they were committed to their Father in heaven, they had a strong relationship with their Father and with Jesus Christ, and they didn't look to a man. They didn't look to an individual or an organization or, or whatever it is. They looked and they kept their eyes on the Father and Jesus Christ, just as Jesus Christ's example was. He was always about his Father's business. He always talked about the Father and glorifying his Father in heaven. Where were their hearts focused? When the uh, messages began to be preached that it's okay, you can go eat pork today, you can go have shellfish, you don't have to keep God's commandments. We are not saved by keeping God's commandments. We show we are his children by keeping his commandments. We show our love toward him by keeping his commandments. Jesus Christ simply said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's that simple. It gets so convoluted, so complicated, and it shouldn't be. Why did they allow something to become, come between them and their relationship with God? <clears throat> Many used an excuse of the leadership for them to just fall away from the truth. They're going to answer before God Almighty because each one of us are going to give an account. Each one of us are going to have to explain why we did certain things. God's word says every idle word you'll give an account of. How much more our actions? How much more when we do things that are contrary? I know we make mistakes. I'm not talking about that, brethren. I'm talking about commitment. and I'm talking about turning away from the covenant that you entered with God Almighty, because many have. And you're going to see more. You're going to see more because the tough times aren't here yet. And when the going gets tough, that's when the test really happens. Who's for real? Joshua and Caleb were for real, weren't they? They were the only two of that generation that entered into life, that entered into that promised land. I said life, I meant promised land. They've not been given eternal life yet. They will be at the resurrection. There is only one way that leads to life. And it's outlined in the instruction manual that God gave us. His word. From Genesis to Revelation. And Jesus Christ is our salvation. It's through his shed blood and his broken body. And with that is a way of life that we show we are his. How many did he heal? How many did he say, go and sin no more? He didn't say, go and, hey, glad I could help you out and just keep living your life like you are. He didn't say that. He said, go and sin no more. He died for our sins, not for us to continue living in sin. Some don't understand. Some have been 30 years in the church and sometimes still don't get it, how simple it is. If you will enter into life, and that's the title of this message, if you will enter into life, or maybe you could just make it personal, if I will enter into life. Because, brethren, our relationship isn't between any man, any minister, anyone, any organization, and God. It's between you and God. And each one of us, as I mentioned, will be held accountable. And we have to always remember that. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. A man coming to Christ and asking him a question. Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I inherit, that I may have eternal life? And so he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but uh, one, and that is 
our Father. That is God. He was referring to the Father. But if you want to enter into life, now he's going to answer the question. Keep the commandments. It's very simple. Keep the commandments. Keep the way of life. Keep the way of love because that's all they represent is love. The first four, how we are to love God. The fifth one, how we're to love our parents. And the last five, how to love your neighbor as yourself. It's that simple. Do you want to enter into life? Keep the commandments. And we can't keep it for 10 years of our life. You go, whoo, I'm there. It's lifelong. It's a lifelong calling. We have to be steadfast. Why did so many fall away by the very thousands? Right back into the world, some I heard that very afternoon. We're right at the pig trough. I use that because it really shows you. And what I'm talking about is they were right out getting the shellfish and the pork, all the things, boy, they just lusted after. The very afternoon, they get the message that green light, it's all a go. We've been wrong all these years. We taught you wrong. Shame on us. God gives us so many examples in the scriptures, and we can learn so much from what happened to the worldwide church of God that it doesn't happen to the church of God at large today, that it doesn't happen to you and to me, because we have to have at the forefront of mind, it can happen to anyone. It's just like people in their jobs, their careers, sometimes they get full of themselves and they think, I'm not replaceable. Look at what I've done. We are all replaceable. But when we look at it in the context of our spiritual lives, we have to be doing daily, not just one week on, one week off. We have to be doing daily the best that we can, walking in the example of Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us why they fell away. Do you know that? It tells us exactly why they fell away. And it also tells us why, if we fall away, why we are going to. The answer is very clear. If you'll turn to 2 Thessalonians, we'll begin in verse, or, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Some had thought at that time that it had already come. They're saying, no, it has not. Now we're going to tell you when you'll know it's going to come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and I'll tell you, the falling away of the worldwide church of God was at least a minimum a forerunner. The church is so scattered and fragmented today, I don't know how you'd get a tremendous falling away, but, but there certainly could be. God knows where his people are. I only see what I see. But there's people scattered throughout the earth. But it was at minimum a forerunner. And the man of sin is revealed... Now, the man of sin, the false prophet, was not revealed during that fall away. Falling away. Only in type, because what did they say? They said we were wrong. You don't have to keep God's truth. The truth is, it's all grace. Live it up. Do what you want. Go whatever day of the week you want. Sabbath doesn't matter. Don't worry that God said, remember at the beginning of that commandment. Forget that he said it's a sign between me and you. Do whatever you want. They're going to be held accountable. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Just as I don't today. And that's why I will speak the truth and <clears throat> let the chips fall where they may. That's what I have to do. It's a responsibility we each have. <coughs> Excuse me. And the man of sin revealed the son of perdition, 
who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. When I said there's a time of testing, of trial that's going to come upon this earth, this is part of it, what it's referring to. A time that God's word says that uh, they may deceive the very elect. I can't remember exactly how it's worded right now. If possible, he shall deceive the very elect right along those lines. Well, it's only possible if you don't have a strong relationship with our Father and with Jesus Christ. If you're not living the life daily and know what to be looking for because you're studying the scriptures and to know understand what's coming upon this earth. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He's going to show miraculous signs. He says, do you not remember that I was with you when I was with you? I told you these things. Paul had told him those things. He had warned him when he was there. He told him what was going to come upon the earth. He thought it was then. It's now. Our lifetime. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, at the time appointed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Oh, wow, lawlessness was already beginning then, right? Because you remember, it all began in those first years after Christ. Things began to turn into this grace there is grace. Your salvation is a gift of God. It's by God's grace that he gives you that. It's by his grace that he took the death penalty for you so that we can have life. It doesn't give us the right to live in lasciviousness, which is lawlessness. <clears throat> for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's referring to the false prophet, which I believe that you can go to Revelation 19. will tell you how that false prophet's cast into the fire. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. And here's the reason. Here's, here's the big reason of what happened with those that fell away and those that will be falling away. Because they did not receive the love of the truth. Do we have a love of the truth? Do we love what God opened our minds and our hearts to receive his truth? Do we love that? Do we hold that first love? Do we remember? Is it more important to us than our very physical life? Each one can answer that question because only each one of us know the answer. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. Those that don't love the truth, those that are half-hearted, sitting on the fence, I'll do it part-time, I'll do it this time, I'll do it that time. If you're not wholehearted, if you're not committed, you're taking a chance because at some point, Christ is going to try to bring you back. He leaves the 99 to go get the one, and he tries to bring him back. But if they refuse, it comes to a point, God says, that's it. And he will give you over to a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And brethren, I can take you to their churches tomorrow that were committed people or appeared to be committed people in the worldwide church of God. And I'm just using that as an example because what happened should, should shock each one of us to the core of our being of what can happen. And you have to take those lessons and we have to learn from them. The Bible is full of those, full of them. Because they had not a love of the truth that they might be saved. 
And for this, oh, I read that. Uh, verse 12, that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They decided, not going to do it any longer. I got my friends, I got my family, and they're at the church down the street. And I want to be with them. I miss them. I want to be with them. I want to be a part of that. God says if we deny him, he will deny us. And he says if we put our family, our friends, or anything above him, we're not worthy of him. It's as simple as that, brother. We're not worthy of him. We have to put him first, that first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not have anything before me. Put me first. Jesus Christ said the greatest commandment of all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. All of your being. And we have to work at that. We have to work at growing that relationship. And we have to trust God and we have to believe him and believe his word. He said don't worry about what they can do to you physically. You worry about the one that can that can destroy you spiritually. Why all those warnings if there's nothing you have to do? Doesn't make any sense, does it? But yet some will tell you, that's the way it is. And I'm talking about people that knew the truth, that were a part of God's church and had the truth. And some are just asleep and some are just like the Laodiceans <clears throat> they didn't love the truth they didn't love the Sabbath the test commandment as I mentioned God says remember he says remember it's a sign between me and my children forever and I'll just refer Quickly to those verses in Exodus 31, if you want to make a note. Exodus 31, verses 12 through 18. So we can never forget this, because brethren, I'm telling you, you've heard the message here before, many of you that are here. In the end, there will only be two churches before the return of Jesus Christ. There will be the great whore, the false church, and her Protestant daughters that will be right along with her, and there will be the church of God. That's all there's going to be. And there's going to be a, a line, and people are going to have to decide which side of that they're going to be on. For God's people, they should have already made that decision when they made that commitment. But some, because of fear, because of a lack of commitment, because of a lack of love for God and His truth, are going to fall away, and they're not going to pass the test. Why do I tell you that today? Prepare, be ready. Jesus Christ told us, watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things because our Father in heaven in his loving kindness and mercy is going to cut the days short. Because he loves you so much, he's going to cut the days short, but you don't know how short. So we have to be strong in the faith. We must be always moving forward, growing in that grace and knowledge. All of us have work to do. That's why we have to keep looking at ourselves. I have work to do. There's things I have to do. Each one of us do. We all have our weaknesses. We have things to overcome. But the one thing we always have to have at the forefront is a love of our Father and Jesus Christ and a love of the way of life that he's revealed to us. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths, plural, you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I'm the one who sets you apart. I'm the one that died for you. I'm the one that makes you holy because it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ we're looked at as holy to the Father. You're looked at as pure and as white, as the purest white you can imagine because of what Jesus Christ did for us, because his blood is upon us spiritually. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you, and everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. 
Work shall be done for six days. If you're healthy, you're able, he says, work. Work for the six days. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on that Sabbath day shall surely put to death. Wow, God would put people to death for that. But he knew, he knew once Christ came, he was getting rid of that day, right? Because Christ was rose on Sunday morning. Another lie, another deception. He was raised in the end of the Sabbath, Matthew 28, verse 1, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. At the end of that three days and three nights, as he told his apostles, as he told each one, he would arise and he arose. The next morning, Mary and Mary Magdalene came early as it was just getting light. They came the next day to anoint him. He was already gone. He was gone the evening before. And now people use that as, it, as an excuse to break God's word. That's okay. Now, the world doesn't know any better, but any of that have been called and given the truth, they don't have an excuse. They either just walked away from it, got to where they didn't want any more part of it. I know one man, he sat back, and because of his job, after 22 years, finally decided that, boy, the Sabbath is really only the daylight hours. I'm convinced because the night is evil. Really? Really? Who taught you that? I tell you, brethren, the mind, if you allow it, to get away from God and his truth, that's the way the mind works. That is called the carnal nature. We all still have it within us. We are not fully born of God yet until we are changed and we are like him at the last trump. We have to protect what God has given us. We have to protect the truth that God has given us and his spirit within us. We have to nurture and care for it. We have to prepare as a bride. That's what the scripture tells us. Prepare as a bride preparing for her wedding day. Preparing for that day that will be in the kingdom of God. When that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ will rise up and those that are alive will meet him in the air. We have to be prepared for that day. We have to hold fast to that day. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a special time between you and your Creator. He set that time apart to be with you. He set that time apart because He loves you and He knows you need it. He knows that we need the Sabbath. We need to be in His Word. Yes, you can be in it each day. It's different on the Sabbath. It's very important. Christ would walk the garden and teach Adam and Eve on the Sabbath. You can be sure of it. They knew his sound. Go through the scriptures. They knew his sound when he'd come to the garden. He taught them. They shall observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual, a never-ending covenant. It's that simple. And it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Forever. A sign forever. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, speaking of Moses, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Jesus Christ wrote on those stones, the Ten Commandments, each one of them, he's probably right-handed, I'm left-handed, but it doesn't matter. Ooh, there's a new idea. Get rid of that. Let it go. <laughs> I'm just joking. God wrote on that stone. Today he writes upon our hearts and our minds through his Holy Spirit. He guides us if we're willing to follow, if we're willing to listen if we're willing to acquiesce, which is to yield to him, to love him as our father and say, Father, teach me. My Savior, Jesus Christ, teach me. Christ magnified the law to the spiritual level. You can go back through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, when he took it from physical to spiritual. If you're angry at your brother without a cause, you are a murderer. If you lust after a woman or the opposite sex, you are an adulterer. <clears throat> I 
He magnified the law. Why is the church such a mess today? Today, some think we don't even have to have a holy convocation. They'll sit back and they'll tell you, the Holy Spirit has showed me I need to be in Bible study all day on the Sabbath. That's the Sabbath. Well, Bible study is important. I'm not taking away from that. But your father knows better than you do, and your father said you are to have a holy convocation, assembly. You are to assemble. We're going to go through who's supposed to be assembling with here in just a moment because it's really clear. Now, God's word is either true or we can sit back with our imagination and our fascinations and we can twist it and distort it. And where does that all come from? You know as well as I do who it comes from. It's not God's way. We have to look to the scriptures and we have to be firm in what God has given us. We can't sit back and twist it, distort it, and do whatever we please. Can't go take the summer off, take half the year off, whatever you decide. He says you are to assemble with his children every week. Now, let me go backwards a little bit. It's a holy convocation. There are times you're going to be out of town. There's going to be a trip. That's different. I'm not talking about firm 50, okay? But I'm also not saying that we can just go and do as we please and take his day and do whatever we want. He doesn't give us that liberty. <clears throat> God cannot and will not go against his own word. God is a God of truth. And in him there is no variableness. There is no shadow. It is pure truth. And the Holy Spirit is God's power, his essence, and his Holy Spirit wouldn't take you down to a path of destruction. He wouldn't take you there. That's not God's Holy Spirit. I've heard people use it and misuse it. Heard one individual, even a deacon in a church, I'm telling you, brethren, it can happen to anybody if you open your mind to it. Oh, all of a sudden he's got this idea, and there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, let's see, our Savior Jesus Christ actually is the brother of Lucifer. Did you know that? Brethren, I know you, 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 you laugh, or, or you think, how in the world? It happens. His whole family left the church. There was a whole bunch of them, and I don't know if to this day if they're still following that or not, but that's what can happen. Breaks my heart every time I see one go astray. And it should break each and every one of your hearts because if we, like through our Father and Jesus Christ, His Spirit, He says, it's not His will that any would perish, but all would come to a knowledge of the truth. And to have a brother or sister turn away in such an awful way and give up what God has promised and given them. It just should not be. And it should shake each one of us to the core of our being. The true God, the Almighty, and His Son, our Messiah, is not a God of confusion and not a God that has changed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Malachi 3, I believe, verse 6 says, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. People can fool people all they want, but none of us can ever fool God. You can say one thing to God, but he knows your heart. You better say what's in your heart. You better say the truth, because that's what he wants to hear. We cannot fool God. We can fool people. Leviticus 23 just a couple of verses of a reminder here of this holy convocation. I'll go through this quickly. He, uh, Leviticus 23, verses 1 through 4 for your notes. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the eternal, weekly Sabbath, seven annual holy days. That is what's included in his feasts. And say to them, The feast of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. And then he goes on with the first being the weekly Sabbath. 
Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. What makes it holy, brethren? Us convocating doesn't make it holy. It's God's presence being with us. We cannot make the Sabbath holy. The only way it's holy is with God's presence. You shall do no work in it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim. Lay hold of them, proclaim them at their appointed times. That word convocation comes from the Hebrew, number 4744. Something called out. Well, who called it out? Who called the meeting? Who called the gathering? Who called the assembly? Our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It also means a rehearsal, an assembly, calling, convocation. Now there are members in the church that either, either due to health uh, or distance to services, and I've been around some that have come up at the feast, and they're so thankful for the live stream because they cannot get to services. Some live two, three hundred miles, and some are older. They can't drive a hundred miles or whatever. That's a different situation, so don't take some of the words I'm saying, car blanche, that everything fits into it. There's also the DVDs that we provide and that many of the churches of God provide for those that are shut-ins, those that can't attend services. Those who are healthy, those that are within a reasonable distance to travel to church need to be in the church. And they need to be in the church that teaches according to the doctrines of God's word. That teach the truth. And they have no excuse, brethren. And God will hold them accountable. I'm going to say it like it is. God says to preach, preach the word instant. In season, out of season. And he says to cry aloud and spare not and show my children their sin. I don't know if there's any hearing today or will hear. If that's their mindset, that they can just do whatever, it's not from God's word, and they are going to be held accountable. We cannot do things our way, and what we believe God's Holy Spirit is guiding us, they have to be confirmed in the word of God. He gave us his word. He gave it to us for a reason. God is organized. Look at his creation Look at the universe. Look at this earth. You look at everything. It is organized. I hear people talking about organizations. We've got to get over that. You look at the fruits. Look at the fruits of the church and what they're doing. Organization doesn't mean anything other than they're, they've got, uh, you know, for, for tax purposes, a 501c. It has nothing to do with lording over God's heritage or any of that. We don't do that. I don't know of any church of God today that does. And we as ministers or those in leadership should never do that. God's word strongly warns against that. We are to serve in love and esteem others better than ourselves. God sets the members in the church as it pleases him. Many will not follow that. They don't want anything to do with that. They're not going to allow God's Holy Spirit to guide them with the church they should be with because whatever reasons they don't like. Well, I don't want to do it that way. I want my service at home, and I want it at 10 in the morning, so I've got my afternoon free, or whatever it is. I, you know, I'm just making stuff up because I don't know. I don't know what they think. I really don't know what they think. I do know that they're not willing to work with their brethren and get along. And if you can't get along with God's children here today, how are you going to do it in the kingdom? Amen. I guess then it's all magic. Everything just comes together. First Corinthians 12. I want to go through this briefly, but I want to illustrate some key points about the body and how God has put it together for the church to be together but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. As he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? 
So it's not singular, one out there, right? Now they can be part of the spiritual organization or organism. And like I was saying, maybe they can't make it to services or whatever. But we're talking about those that are close enough. They need to be in services. They need to be together. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Well, many are. Because they don't want to uh, have a holy uh, convocation. They don't want to assemble together. They want to have their own and they'll use the scripture where two or more are gathered. And we did it. We're good. Why does God have this if that's the case? If it's that simple, why does he go through here? This is God breathed. And he had Paul write this letter to the church in Corinth about the body that Christ put together. The eye can't say, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And of course, Christ is the head. We are parts of the body. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And whose members of the body which we think to be less honorable, those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. It's talking about all different parts. Some bear different amounts of fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Together, we're the body. Together, we strengthen one another. Together, we help one another. Together, we uplift one another. And we encourage one another. We give each other a hug and ask, how have you been? How can I help you if there's something going on? Did God know what he was doing? Well, you know I'm being sarcastic because we know God knows exactly what he's doing. I wish people would put whatever their problems are aside and work through them and get themselves where they ought to be. And I'm not saying it has to be this building. Whatever church of God in this area and for whatever other area that people have left and gone to, to do whatever, to wake up, wake up and do what you've been called out to do. It's not just sitting home thinking about yourself. Verse 24, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no division in the body. That word schism is division. That goes against God's will. But that the members should have the same care for one another. I mentioned, I referenced the scripture earlier that God says, you'll know my disciples by the love that they have for one another. He tells us in another place, by their fruits, you will know them. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles and second prophets, third teachers, and after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? We were singing that one hymn, and it uh, talked about tomorrow. I can't remember which one, and I was tempted to say manana. It's one of the few Spanish words I know, and that would have been a tongue, right? Manana. But he says, earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Brethren, God has given each one of us gifts. Gifts that as we come together as a body, help one another. That edify one another. Some are good listeners. Some that you know and you know what you can talk to. And they listen to you. They actually listen to your words. And they console with you. And they pray for you. And how uplifted you are. How uplifted are you when you leave services. I, I really hope that you are. If not, let me know because there's something we're not doing right here. 
We should all come to church and we should all leave here feeling better than we did when we came in. I know so many times, you know, you have the stress of the week and all that. And I'll tell you, just when I come to church and I'm with my brothers and sisters, the peace that I feel, how good that I feel to see each one of you. Some have been appointed to offices. All have a purpose. And we're here to fulfill that commission. Feeding the flock is part of that. Jesus asked Peter three times, right? Feed my sheep. That's how important it is to feed the sheep. We all need to be fed. We need to come here and be fed. And those that are listening online and wherever you meet, and some of you can't be with brethren, and I tell you, brethren, those that can't, they hurt. I, they've come up to me in tears, crying. How thankful they are to have the live stream, that they can actually feel like they're a part of a service, something that, that when you're there every week, you just can take for granted if we're not careful. And there's some that just can't be. They can't give a hug to a brother or sister. They can't talk to someone and share a meal together. We have so much to be thankful for. Go ye therefore into all the earth. That's the other part of the commission. And then we have the part of those lost sheep that are out there. And we hope and we pray that they come back. Many times there's messages that I know brethren share with those that they know that have left the worldwide church of God or the church of God uh, since then at some point, wherever, to try to help them, to encourage them, to get back with it, to get back on board like the prodigal son. You spent everything you had, and he ended up slopping the hogs. And he said, you know what? It's better that I go home. I'd be better to be a slave to my father than to do what I'm doing here. Refresh yourself with that parable. And the father met him in the street, and they killed the fatted calf, and he said, come on home. And he talked to his brother. His brother was pretty upset. He went and spent everything that he had, father, that you gave him. He blew it. He blew it in sin. And his father said, my son's saved now. I'm just paraphrasing. He has repented. He has turned. And now he has his life back. And that's what we hope for each and every one of them that have turned away from the greatest calling. God has given us the greatest of callings to be his child in the kingdom of God forevermore. Those who have been called and repented of their sins and entered those waters of baptism and entered that covenant of I will, Father. We are being judged today. 1 Peter 4, verses 17 through 19. I don't have to really pick this up. Beginning in verse 17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the good news of God? If judgment begins with the church of God now, what will be the end of those who do not obey the good news of God? That good news that he called you with when he illuminated, illuminated us and gave us his wonderful truth. Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, these are pretty serious words here, brethren. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wow. Wow. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their lives to him in doing good. Therefore, let those who suffer, those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are happening all around them, those that are committed and steadfast and walking each day as best they can in the calling that God has given them, walking as best they can in the example of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, those who are suffering according to the will of God commit their lives to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. 
We are being judged today, brethren, and we will give an account. Luke 13. <clears throat> Luke 13 tells us how we're to walk through the narrow gate. Luke 13, beginning in verse 23, one said to him, one talking to Christ, Are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Well, the world says it's pretty broad. It's pretty broad. It's not what the scripture says. Strive to enter the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Many will try to enter and they will not be able to. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin, boy, I tell you, it reminds me of the time of Noah. And they built that ark, and he was mocked and laughed at, him and his family. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he's preaching, and he's warning the people. The warning is going out, just as the warning today. Thy kingdom come, the kingdom of God is coming. And that door was shut, and you know the rest of that story. And you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. Lord, open the door. Save us. Help us. Saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? I don't know you. Where are you from? Just, just like you've been blotted out. I don't even know you. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. If there's anybody that says God's law is not extant, they need to read, read these scriptures about lasciviousness, which is lawlessness. They're very clear. Very clear what's going to happen in the end times. And just like right here, oh, there's no law? Well, then there's no sin. There's no iniquity. Blot the words from the book. They don't belong there. I mean, that's how pathetic it is to say such a thing. Now, I'm talking about people that knew the truth of God Almighty. I'm not talking about the world that hasn't had their minds opened yet. They don't know anything. They're living their lives as they know how or how they've chosen to. And whatever churches they attend, they're doing what they know to, to their ability. It's not our matter. I'm talking about those that God has opened their mind and he said, I want you. I want you in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is in the first resurrection on whom the second death has no power. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Is Sabbath breaking iniquity? Absolutely. Just like murder. Just like adultery. First four commandments are how to love God. That includes that test commandment and having no other gods before him, and not having any graven images, right? We're not to have images, and you don't see any in this church, just as we shouldn't have in our personal lives either. And we don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and we remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor the stranger within thy gates. For in six days the Lord created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And he rested the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land that the Lord thy God has given you. Thou shalt not murder Thou shalt not 
commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, you shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Ten beautiful commandments that breaking any one of them is iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, many times people, I, I think even myself over the years, you know, I was brought up in, in uh, mainstream uh, Church of Nazarene and uh, Pentecostal and whatnot, and you hear a lot of hellfire messages. I've heard a lot of hellfire messages. And you, I always thought about that weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's from the fire. It's from the fire. But I tell you, brethren, it's from seeing the kingdom of God Almighty and knowing that Jesus Christ just shut the door to you. And your life is done. Depart from me. I do not know you. Where are you from? We don't want to hear those words. I don't want one brother, one sister, one that's had the opportunity to be in the God family to lose their salvation. Sadly, I can't make decisions for them, nor can I for you. I can only make my own. But each one of us is confronted each day with choices. And we have to make a decision, sometimes many decisions in a day. Sometimes we fall short. We're not perfect. I'm not preaching about perfection. We're to work toward perfection. And we go before our Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we say, please forgive me, just as he told us in that prayer that we pray daily. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others, as we forgive their transgressions. And brethren, if we're not a forgiving people, God's going to treat you the same way. It's as simple as that. We have to be a forgiving and loving people. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. They will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed there are last who will be first and there are first who will be last God's word is true God's children must strive to enter the narrow gate God's children must strive to keep and hold fast to that first love the calling that God has given you to be a part of his family we live in serious times and serious times require serious action What's coming is times of tribulation and trial. Times of the church falling asleep, and I believe that has already begun. Times that many of God's people will look to teachers having itching ears and want to hear smooth things. People that will not seek truth. I have a lot of material left for this message today. But I think we'll stop here and I'll do part two in a couple of weeks. I don't want to just cut this up because God has given some very powerful scriptures here that really nail all this right to the wall. I want to share something with you as, as we close this part of the message. Probably 15 years ago, I heard a little sermonette that has always stuck with me. It was uh, titled, Eight Little Words. Eight Little Words, and the premise was about being in the kingdom of God. How am I going to be in the kingdom of God? And those eight little words are this. If it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to be, it is up to me. Those eight little words, brethren, apply to each one of our lives and our calling. If we're to be in God's kingdom, he has put it within our hands. He's given us his spirit. He's given us everything we need to overcome. He's given us power. He's given us love and a sound mind. 
and he expects us to use it. He expects us to be steadfast. He expects us not to put to forsake all others and put him first in our lives and to be the lights and don't hide that light. Be a light by your example. You don't have to go calling on doors and knocking on doors and tapping people on the shoulder. What you have to do is live your life in your job, in your home, in your family. Each one of us live our lives showing forth the light of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and our Father in heaven. Show forth that spirit in your life. Show that commitment, that dedication, that steadfastness, that love of the truth. The love of the truth. Never let go of it. Thank you.